Our next speaker is um, quite an honor that he is here to speak to us, David, David Krakauer. He is an evolutionary biologist and the president and William H. Miller Professor of Complex Systems at the Santa Fe Institute. He also co-directs the Collective Computation Group at the Santa Fe Institute. And prior to all of that, David served as the founding director of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, as well as the co-director of the Center for Complexity and Collective Computation, and as a professor of mathematical genetics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. That's only part of his introduction, part of his resume. David has also held positions at, uh, as a visiting fellow at the Genomics Frontiers Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also been a SAGE fellow at the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind at the University of California, Santa Barbara, a long-term fellow uh, of the Institute uh, for Advanced Study in Princeton, and a visiting professor of evolution at Princeton University. And if that wasn't enough, in 2012, he was included in uh, the Wired Magazine Smart List as one of the 50 people who will change the world. And he's here with us today. So I am thrilled to have him join us today. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you all David Krakauer. Hello, everybody. Morning. Thank you very much. Those, can you all hear me? Great. Yeah, those sort of little introductions. Who are they talking about? Who is this person that's not me that's being introduced? So um, I, I'm just going to jump right in um, to my slides to make sure this all works. Um, and let's see. Is that all visible to you? Great. So I'm going to start in some sense anti-system, and then we're going to migrate toward a system. Um, this is a quote I rather love. This is a quote from Murray Gell-Mann's 1969 Nobel acceptance speech. Murray is one of the founders of the Center Institute, as some of you will know. Um, and he said, how can it be that writing down a few simple and elegant formulae like short poems governed by strict rules, such as those of the sonnet or the waka, can predict universal regularities of nature. The waka, by the way, is the um, ancestor of the haiku. It would be a little bit too pedestrian for Murray to say haiku, so he says waka instead. So, and this comes out of the work that Murray had done that won him the Nobel Prize on recognizing fundamental symmetries in nature. And he wrote down what's become famous as the so-called Eightfold Way, which is the symmetry group um, of the hadrons, which are fundamental particles. And it's an extraordinary achievement because you write down this, what seems like an invention of the human mind, that is the Lie algebra for the special unitary group three. And out of that pops a prediction of a hidden fat facet of reality. Right? A, a subatomic particle. And this is the great mystery, of, if you like, of applied mathematics. So that's that Murray. But there's another Murray that was associated with the founding of the Santa Fe Institute. It's the Murray who asked this question, which was, think how hard physics would be if particles could think. Now, this uh, is in some sense the rallying cry for complexity science. It says, Instead of a, a world dominated by conservation laws, conservation of energy and matter and fundamental symmetries, it's a world dominated by agency, self-awareness, consciousness, reflexivity, system two, you know, you pick your favorite phrase. How do you understand those kinds of worlds where the uh, system itself is learning and adapting, responding to your observations in such a way as to stifle or stymie your future efforts to predict them. And that led quite naturally to this remark, which I think would resonate with everyone at this meeting, where he essentially makes the point that the, the complexity of connections in the modern world is so dense um, that, there's a real argument for studying some emergent system, uh, which he calls the whole system, rather than pursue that disciplinary um, 
convenience of dissecting the world into its individual components of the kind that Murray had worked on as a physicist. And I've often wondered what Murray meant when he said whole system. Um, th that's been confusing to me. It's almost as if what Murray did is he started as a reductionist physicist working on the atoms and quarks and gluons and took some kind of long jump uh, by helping to construct the Santa Fe Institute and landing on the whole system, which is the planetary system itself. And I think this is a, a significant challenge. And, and I think what Murray actually meant was looking at that point, if you like, of highest elevation, where we're not studying the whole system. I think that's actually arguably impossible, but we're studying the systems of the world. Um, and I want to argue throughout this presentation that the systems of the world should be thought of as verbs, not nouns. And I mean, when I go to meetings, people will say we should study the energy sector or the communication sector or the global banking system. These to me are objects and artifacts, as opposed to studying processes that actually transcend any given one of those systems, if you like. And, and that's what I'll argue for. Not to say that you can't do the former, I, that would be perfectly reasonable and fascinating, but I'm more interested in the generalities that span them. And so this will be essentially the, the table of my talk in a nutshell. And we're gonna dive into some of the details because I think the, the, the interest of, the, of this approach to, to working on systems lives in the detailed way in which we analyze them. And so, for example, um, conflict. It's obviously all of these topics I imagine are of great interest today in the world. Can we understand conflict both at the individual level, right? That is individual fights, if you like, all the way through to wars at the, at the level of nation states. Is it meaningful, for example, to describe them both as conflict or is that just a sort of historical accident that we use the same word to describe events at different scales? And I'm going to argue that the only sense in which it's meaningful is if you can find the mechanics or the models that are constitutive of the process, right, and demonstrate that, that actually, yes, they are, because what we mean in both cases is a certain notion of criticality, and I'm going to jump into that in a second. Another one, culture. How does culture actually work? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're suspended ambiently in a world of beliefs and ideas. How do we acquire them? How do we transmit them? And that this notion of culture is very um, diffuse, right? So we go from the culture of individual beliefs and norms all the way through to, you know, enforceable legal systems. And again, is that real? I mean, are we correct in asserting that these are elements of culture? And I, I think the answer is yes, because in each case, we're talking about attitudes towards imitation transmission, if you like the sort of essential modules or atoms of cultural evolution and so forth. Again, what is constitutive of that notion of culture? And I'm gonna focus there on, on, on the evolution of constitutions. And finally, revolutions, social revolutions, scientific revolutions. Um, why do some institutions emerge and then freeze and that are extraordinarily difficult to change? Whereas others seem to be in flux all the time. Can we? come to some fundamental understanding about why that's true. Um, and again, here I think the answer is yes, we can. We have to think about structures and orders that have multiple timescales and the way learning rules percolate through those timescales. Um, so as to either engender fixity, stasis or evolution and change. So that'll be the sort of that sort of the talk. And I'm gonna jump into empirical case studies with mathematical models. Don't worry too much if it all looks a bit heady. Um, just to say that I think that to do this, to study this, you have to do this. In other words, with the essentials of the scientific method, that is empirical data, model building and experiment are no less important here than they would be in any disciplinary pursuit. It's just that we're doing something rather differently. So let's start with this conflict and contagion issue. Um, let me just talk about criticality first. This is a, a plot that you would have all seen if you're watching the news at any point in the last three years, which is sort of flat on the curve, right? So this is a series of projected epidemic profiles for, of COVID, for example, um, 
assuming different critical exponents R0 or R0 in England. This is that thing which we've all become familiar with, which is the number of secondary infections initiated by a primary infection. So in that little picture on the top right, you can see that if R0 or R0 is five, then a single initial infection will lead to five secondary infections and so on. And we've all learned that as you move the critical exponent R0 closer to one, we flatten the curve. And if R0 is below one, the, the epidemic would peter out. So this is what's meant by contagion, this propagation of infection. And it's also what is meant by a critical exponent, which is this threshold value, magic value, below which an infection is subcritical and above which it's supercritical. Okay. Many people have claimed in the literature that conflict is something like a contagion. It spreads from one person to another through a mechanic, which is somewhat dissimilar, I imagine, what we know, to an infectious disease. And moreover, it shows critical phenomena. That is that there is some threshold value of aggression um, or adversarial interaction above which conflict becomes supercritical and below which it would be subcritical. And the idea, I guess, of the Pacific dream would be to get those critical exponents below one, right? So as to move into subcritical regimes. Is any of this true? There's a huge literature. Well, to, to answer that question, we have to look at the data and we have to build mathematical models and answer this question of whether or not conflict really is a contagion or not. Um, so here's the kind of basic questions we might want to ask ourselves. Is it true? Does it have a critical transition? Is there a relationship, for example, between the conflict duration, the number of fatal fatalities, the, the geographical area that it encompasses? And if that's all true, what are the normative implications? That is, we're not just doing um, descriptive natural history of conflict. We want to intervene in such a way as to minimize it. The way, of, for example, a physician might want make recommendations for mask wearing so as to minimize the spread of a pandemic. So those are the, the sorts of questions. So in order to answer this, now, no, I wonder if I can see, you can see this. Is anything blocked here, by the way, Laura, or can you see the whole screen? Because on my own, it's all good. We can see the whole screen. Oh, great, great, great. So, um, so the way we do this is we look at two kinds of systems. We look at experimental systems, non-human systems that we can intervene into. And um, so these are small populations, every individual can be monitored, and we're looking at the individual conflict rules that individuals are following, so very micro. On the other hand, we have large scale observational data of human populations, very macro. And in that case, we're inferring quite different kinds of scaling relations, not individual decision rules. And so I just want to make that point about model systems versus observational systems. It, it leads to a lot of um, heated debate. I think one should look at both because they each have strengths and weaknesses. Um, so let me just give you one example. This is something we've been studying for many years, non-human primates, macaques, spider monkeys, and so on. And here, just to give you a sense, we can look at any given moment in time, these are animals in captivity, at who is fighting or not fighting, at any given point in time, so very micro. We can see who interacts with whom, we can reconstruct social networks of their interactions and so on. And out of that kind of data, you can get all sorts of interesting insights, but let me give you one example. This is the scaling of the, on log log axes, of the conflict duration and conflict size. Just notice that as the uh, number of individuals in a particular conflict increases, so does the duration of the conflict. And it increases polynomially, it, in, it increases as, as the square of the number of individuals. You can also look at the variance, not just the mean. So this is the distribution of how long peace bouts last. So for example, no one's fighting anyone for 10 seconds, 10 minutes, an hour, and so on, and conflict durations. And you'll notice that if you look at the distribution of durations, as they get longer, the variance increases. So the scatter around that distribution increases. 
So here's just some data. And what one can now do is write down a whole family, don't worry about the details of mathematical models, and explore the full configuration space of possible contagion processes, not just one or two, but a very large number, and ask which ones of those mathematical models are consistent with the scaling relationships, for example, that one observes in the data, the scaling of the mean and the scaling of the variance. And you'll see that most contagion processes actually can't recover uh, the observed data. And this is quite important because in many studies, people will assert contagion without checking carefully against the empirical data, which would either refute or confirm transiently the hypothesis. And what we find just to, is, is the critical role of agency. It is a contagion process, but with one really interesting characteristic, which is long-term memory. That is, the memory of the first conflict and its duration is felt throughout all subsequent conflicts. That is not a property of a, of a biological epidemic. There's a very different kind of contagion. It's contagion with significant memory in it, which is that sort of agency fact, that self-awareness fact. And we all know that, and resentments are very long lasting. So an attempt, for example, to intervene on a human conflict contagion as if it were a biological contagion, without taking into account the sort of psychological fact of memory would fail. So that's just one example. Uh, we've also looked, as I said, at the more coarse grained data. We've looked, you, this is the so-called ACLED database, it's extraordinarily rich. And we've been studying conflicts in continental Africa for two decades. Uh, looking at things that are very similar actually to the micro data I just showed you. And here you don't have who's fighting whom at a given point in time, but what you do have is data like this, where over the course of time you have battles, the number of fatalities, um, exact geographical locations and so forth. So we can study time and space, but at a much more um, low resolution than we would in the experimental system. And as with the experimental system, we can look at things like the distribution of conflict sizes, uh, the distribution of fatalities, duration, and spatial extent. And as with the micro data, we can write down mathematical models. This is a rather complicated model. I'm, gonna leave, I'm not gonna describe this one in any detail, but just the idea that contagions grow as a kind of a fractal, like branching pattern on a two-dimensional surface. And one of the things that these models predict is that at critical points, like for example, R0 equals one, that is that critical point below which an epidemic is um, subcritical, above which it's supercritical, something really interesting happens. You get a complete collapse of complexity. And all of those scaling exponents become related. It's actually a really beautiful feature of complex systems that at critical points, they become simple. Uh, and the, for those who are interested in the form of analysis, this is using something called renormalization group theory. It's a, it's a way of looking across scales. And you can see, and just take my word for it if you like, that if you look at the, the ratios of the empirical data against the model predictions, they're extraordinarily close, which suggests two things again. Yes, this is a contagion-like phenomenon, so that's a correct statement, but it's also a contagion-like process that's near criticality. And this is very surprising um, because it's not clear why that should be the case. So if you think about an epidemic with R0, why would R0 hover around one? Why would it live by a critical point? And we all know the answer actually, because we're observing it today. And that is that if R0 or R0, I never quite know, I've sort of been in the United States long enough to want to say zero, but my answer, my early life was in England, so I want to say naught. So I'm going to be at the critical point where I say both. And um, if you think about it, when the epidemic is in full blast, we start taking precautions. We wear masks, we get vaccinated, we get boosted, and we shift R0 down. But when R0 falls below one, the epidemic starts petering out. And what happens? We take off our masks, right? Because we think, oh, look, we've won. And then what happens, the new strain emerges and it propagates back in and we put our mask back on. And this is one of the so-called routes to endemism. And that phenomenon of a system hovering around the critical point is called self-organized criticality. 
And it seems as if conflict is manifesting this phenomenon of hovering by a critical point. So, okay, so is it contagious? Yes, uh, with a strong agency memory effect. Does it have a critical transition? Yes, but we don't know exactly where it is. We don't know the R0 of human conflict. Um, you get this incredibly interesting simplification of the system of conflict at the critical point where all the scaling exponents become related. Um, and the normative implications for us are deliberative techniques to move systems away from critical points. And that's a whole area of investigation we've pursued. And I, I, perhaps we, in the questions, we're going to deal with it. But if you look at my website, there's some things on that there. So that's just one example. Let's keep jumping. Look at culture. Um, how on earth should we model culture? And this is, again, my view is you have to take a representative model system where good data is available. And you could look at Twitter, you could look at newspapers, it almost doesn't matter as long as you're rigorous and uh, you know, consistent in the way you do this. So we've been looking at constitutional history. And so this is a very famous painting, it was painted in, 17, in 1940. It relates to the signing of the constitution, the American constitution in 1789. And you can see in that picture, I'm sure a few uh, familiar faces. And what we do working with constitutional historians and lawyers is we take a constitution and we atomize it. We break it down into its essential themes. And for those interested in machine learning um, or natural language analysis, these atoms are called topics. Um, so for example, oops, these are my questions. Um, let's just skip them, we'll come back to them. So here's a constitution, we're gonna break it up into its basic lexical atoms, the way it treats general rights, the way it treats sovereignty, public order. And we're gonna ask, how do these themes diffuse forward in time through constitutions? The way that constitutions are written is you don't sit down in a room and write one for your nation de novo, out of nowhere ex ovo, you look at prior constitutions and you borrow from them. And uh, what you can do mathematically is reconstruct the phylogenetic tree of all constitutions that have ever been written. And if we, if we zoom in on this, you can see, here's the constitution of Egypt of 1923. It was highly influential on Burundi 62, Albania 25, Yugoslavia 31, Iraq 1925. These are obviously arrayed in chronological order. Um, what's going on here? Uh, which topics are circulating? How is borrowing taking place and why? What's the impact of local culture and geography? And I'm gonna skip all that for today, but just give you a sort of sense of what you can say in this kind of structure. We can sort of leap in and look at the micro geometry of that tree. What you're looking at here, if you look at the center, you have the focal constitution of interest, it has a number of parents that it borrowed from that we've inferred using some techniques and a number of offspring that it influenced that borrowed from it. And we can reconstruct this kind of zoo of geometries of, of all the constitutions. All of these are essentially that structure on the left, but giving you a sense of the diversity of constitutional forms that we can reconstruct going back to 1789. And these actually correspond to particular constitutions. You can look at the bottom one, that's the constitution of Montenegro. It had three parents, no offspring. Right. Um, the interesting one is the South Korean constitution of 1948. That's that one sort of third from the bottom. It has a small number of parents, but a lot of offspring. That's a very influential constitution, right? And so we can start asking, which constitutions are highly inventive? Which ones had disproportional impact? Which ones are sterile, actually never led to offspring and so on. Um, and so complicated plot, but what, if you look at the lifespan of a constitution, the lifespan is defined as when it was written and when it, start, it stopped being borrowed from, right? No one looks at it anymore. The US constitution is very interesting. It was very influential early, 
but it was so influential on secondary constitutions that they borrowed from those instead of the founding constitution. And top left, you see a tree of all the constitutions. You see three clear epochs, founding 1789 up until the Second World War. This is a period of a relatively slow rate of constitution writing, and all the constitutions are very long lived. Then during the war and subsequent, you get an acceleration of the production of constitutions, most of which are very short lived. So quite distinct cultural phases uh, in relation to this particular object, which is interesting because what are constitutions? They establish branches of government, uh, the separation of powers, property rights, issues about freedom of expression. These are in some sense, the operating systems of societies and they have a very interesting dynamic. And out of that, we can then answer these questions. How is culture transmitted? Culture is transmitted a little bit like genetics. It's not genes, it's core constellations of concepts like rights, property rights, uh, structures of government. Which ideas are most influential in constitutions? Strong early mover advantage. We see quite unequivocally that if you're early, early in the, the writing of the constitution, you will be an influential one. It almost doesn't matter what you write about because you become a source of um, influence on subsequent constitutional authors. Um, this is a preferential attachment dynamic that many of you will be familiar with. It happens, for example, with Uber, <laughs> happened with eBay, happened with Etsy. The being there first and becoming the preferred market for ideas is a long lasting effect. And it's no less true for these ancient cultural forms than it is for contemporary technological forms. Even though many have claimed that the dynamics of, of software um, is different, it actually isn't. <laughs> you, it seems to be a more universal dynamic of culture uh, than uh, a particular mechanic of the contemporary world. And, and this really interesting point that it's better to be revolutionary than evolutionary if you're writing constitutions. That is the highly inventive constitutions that, that add new topics, if you like, new categories of thought are the ones that people look to, not the ones that add one or two increments on what came before them. So be first and be radical is the sort of, if you like, the message of constitutional history. Finally, revolutions. Like everyone else, I'm interested in revolutions, particularly scientific revolutions, but during the last few years, social revolutions. Um, the whole Black Lose, uh, Lives Matter protest is of great interest to me personally. Um, and how can we understand what's going on here? Why, why does society seem to go through periods of stasis and then these incredibly rapid bursts of change? What, is there a sort of unifying framework for evolution and revolution in social systems? Uh, the kinds of things I'm interested in, things like this, you know, why do we go from extraordinary intolerance of homosexuality to accepting it, uh, going so far as to allow for gay marriage, uh, which to me is a real fantastic evolutionary move of society. What, what changed in people's thinking? By the way, there's a nice typo here. This is Oscar Wilde 1985, which is not quite right if, if history. Um, so, this, you know, attitudes to this is called a fiction on the left. For anyone interested in rock history, you realize these are two very different people. But this sort of scare tactics that people have used to sort of discourage people from taking recreational drugs, and maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. Uh, but then this shift towards a much more permissive um, society. Political beliefs, I mean, endlessly oscillating back and forth uh, between political parties. Can we sort of wrap this system up? in a common mathematical framework so that we can understand properties of all of them. Um, and as I said, I think the answer is yes, because they're all characterized by having multiple timescales with individual learning rules that percolate up through the timescales, often in invisible ways, leading to very dramatic shifts. The kind of data that we look at to see if your sense is, is data like this, all across the board. Why, for example, did seat belts, once they're ad adopted, lock? It's very unlikely that we're gonna move back to a state where people say, you know, let's get rid of the 
mandatory seatbelt law. It seems like a bad idea. Um, whereas political parties' uh, fortunes are constantly shifting. Attitudes towards the death penalty are constantly shifting and so on. I mean, it would be kind of nice, right, if attitudes towards same-sex marriage or the death penalty look more like the seatbelt in a progressive sense. And once we'd adopted them, we stayed that way and didn't constantly fluctuate back. Can we understand all of this? And so these are the kinds of questions we're asking here. How did these systems evolve? How do we as individuals or as collectives contribute to these institutions? So I use this word institution, by the way, to mean scientific belief systems or organizations, companies, it could be IBM. Um, how do individual micro learning rules percolate through to the emergent structure of the, of the macro properties of, of the institution? And um, what does an institution do <laughs> that wants to change, um, but finds itself like the, the seatbelt locked in? You know, can we, are there normative implications just as there were for conflict? This is the basic structure of these models. You have collectives at the bottom. Um, they express their support or opposition to an institution through voting mechanics. Uh, and we think of the institutions as a ledger that records in its entries votes. It aggregates preferences and beliefs. And it has a public position. And that public position feeds back to reinforce or inhibit uh, the collectives that are learning to support or inhibit them. In other words, members of, of, of a Republican party will support their own party, but they will do everything in their power to oppose the Democratic party and democratic beliefs and vice versa. So the same kind of logic applies, by the way, to scientific revolutions. Here's the so-called Copernican revolution. You have Copernicus saying, you know, you know, everybody, <laughs> the sun is at the center of the solar system. It's, it's kind of the parsimonious thing. But you've got the church saying, well, no, it's kind of a little bit at odds with what we've been saying for the last however many thousand years. We'd rather you shut up. And so again, that sort of dynamic of voting uh, opposition and support with feedback from the institutions, because that's crucial, right? Because if the institution helps you, um, it, you gain power. And we can take that and mathematize it. Uh, for those of you with keen eyes, you'll see this looks like a perceptron. It's a very simple neural network, but it's all analytical, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, mathematize it. And explore, this is gonna be the slight technical point and it's coming to the end, which I would like you to sort of get your heads around. The crucial role of learning rules, which are the rules that reinforce your beliefs and support or opposition based on the success of your corresponding institution. So here, let me just show you what I mean. So here's a case, let's say X supports IX and Y supports IY, the institution Y. One learning rule would be simply to say, look, if there's lots of us, lots of X's, lots of, let's say, supporters of the Copernican revolution, we're going to support Copernicus in all publications that promulgate a heliocentric position. Vice versa, right, if you're a member of, let's say, at the time, uh, a religious fraternity or church, if you're more numerous, you'll support your institutions, in that case, they say the Catholic Church. That's one kind of rule. It says you learn in accordance with your success. Another kind of rule is quite opposite to that, is that um, actually I might just attend, if I'm being successful, why bother? Why bother doing more work? I've already won. I'm gonna divest from supporting my institution because I'm in the leading position. Here's an interesting one, an arms race. An arms race says, I'm gonna support my institution in proportion to the success of my rival. So think about uh, nuclear expansion. If, if your opponent doesn't have weapons, then why should you? So your support of your institution is in proportion to your competitor's abundance. So you can write down all these simple rules uh, which tell you how to construct institutions according to their abundance, if you like, or power or size. And on and on you can go and you can actually mathematically look at all possible permutations. 
And if you do that, you make some interesting discoveries. That if you use, for example, this rule which says, invest in your institution in proportion to its size, you get lock-in. You're gonna fix on a single institution and never change it. And you can sort of see intuitively why that's the case because you're not attending to the competitor at all. And the bigger you get and the bigger your institution becomes, the more you support it, lock-in. The same is true for other rules. The arms race is the opposite, right? It says, I support my institution in proportion to the competitor. That leads to endless cycling, periodicity. So what this sort of work is showing is that the incentive system that society puts in place, that is the reinforcement learning rule, has strong emergent consequences on the stasis or lability of the corresponding institution. And that suggests that you could change them. So for example, let's say you were in a lock-in situation and you're a company like Kodak, and you say, well, look, we make the best film in the world, we should make more of it. And then all of a sudden the market changes and you're extinct. You could, as a leadership team say, I'm gonna create a new learning rule amongst my employees that instead of investing in proportion to our market share, we're gonna look at the competitor change the norms, change the incentives, and move into an oscillatory regime where you allow for the possibility of flexibility. So this is just an example of these very counterintuitive ways in which local incentive and learning systems have emergent properties at the institutional level. And I just wanted to make that point. That rule there is an institutional black hole. This is Kodak, this is research in motion. Um, you follow these rules, stasis. So, okay, so how do institution evolves? in this particular case, feedback from the institutions that are established through some collective voting dynamic. Um, how do you construct, use different learning rules to do so? Um, these rules in a very non-intuitive way bias the stability of the institutions. And how do you change? You have to change the learning rule. You have to, that's the key and that's very hard. So let's just end with this. Murray's statement, Murray making that point that we're living in this highly connected world, someone should be studying the whole system. I think that the correct interpretation of that kind of insight is that we should be studying global representative systems that have a mechanic that is constitutive of that system. Um, we should be studying culture, conflict, institutions, cities, pandemics. These are the kinds of processes where we have a principled means of attaching to them mechanics and dynamics. Um, the whole system, I have absolutely no idea, it's a spaghetti. And you'll note that these aren't disciplines, they span them, but they're as disciplined as the disciplines, which is the sort of mantra that I, I try my best to follow. So if for those interested in SFI, go to our web page. Um, you can, if you scroll down, to the bottom of the Santa Fe Institute webpage, you can subscribe to our publications, um, you can join our podcast. There's all sorts of information available there for you that you will either hate or love <laughs> according to your disposition, uh, but it's worth having a look because there's a lot of material. And with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, just we need a whole day on this. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and I do encourage everybody to go to SFI and, and check out what they're doing. It's a very special place. Do you still do tea, David? Of course we do tea. <laughs> <laughs> tea, was, tea was sort of the most yeah, amazing yeah. thing where you get to meet these just people from all over and talk a little bit about tea. Well, it's interesting, you know, I mean, this is, we've all been debating this move towards this, this world, right? This online world, which has extraordinary, like, like this. I mean, you can yeah. do this sort of thing, which is fantastic. Um, but what, what is missed, and, and I think the obvious point is that this is very telegraphic, right? In other words, I just waffled on for 30 minutes, but we'll have questions for 15, and most people won't have a chance to ask, you know, it's, whereas if you're in person, someone can really pester you, <laughs> so, you know, and it's great. 
but also you can move back and forth, you know, clarifying what people mean, because it's very often takes two or three questions to sort of get to, oh, that's your sense. That's what you mean. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. And so um, T is our sort of mechanic for doing just that. We pretend it's this informal thing, which it is. What it really is, it's recognizing the complexity of human interactions and that it takes time to, to, to understand each other, right? And to, what do you, yeah. So I don't, that's what tea's for. So at, at SFI, they have a courtyard and people just have tea and, and you know, all, all manner of conversations are sparked uh, at tea and, and you could have a physicist and a sociologist and a mathematician and a, you know, uh, all kinds of different people sitting at a table talking about a, an issue. It's fantastic. Well, one thing to say that I'd like to point out, I didn't talk about SFI and its structure, but to do the kind of work that I just described, and it's a tiny slither of work. It happens to be work that I've been involved with. I could have talked about other people's work. Right. Um, you need a different kind of organization. And um, so we don't have obviously departments, we don't have deans, we don't have all that stuff. And so we, and in offices, which are typically shared, you'll have an archeologist with a quantum mechanist, right? And by the end of the summer, they're working on a pro problem together because they like each other. I mean, it's sort of simple as that. <laughs> and um, so the structure uh, respects, I think, the, the mission um, in terms of what we want to accomplish. Yeah. So I'm curious, you started with the, the one of Murray's uh, quotes, uh, think of how difficult physics would be if atoms could think, is a fantastic concept. Um, and Murray Gelman also wrote a, a very short paper called, uh, let's call it Plectics, which yeah. really got at the root definition and root uh, word forms of simple and complex. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship between yeah. simplicity and complexity and why that's important? Yeah, I, I have lots of slides on it. I didn't want to do this because there's so many times, but I will do it verbally. Um, so one way to think about this is that where have the, because we are a quantitative department. I don't think you need to be to, to work in systems or complexity, quite frankly. I think philosophers do it very well um, in natural language, but we could do it that way. Um, the, one way to say this is that, you know, physics has been so successful, the kind that Murray worked on that I illustrated, because it's so simple, meaning there are laws like the conservation of, matter, of energy matter and so forth, the second law of thermodynamics, fundamental symmetries, and that's what mathematics likes, okay? Um, it, it captures in a very compressed, elegant form, regularities the essence of mathematics, like Pythagoras theorem or what have you. At the other end of the spectrum, you have random things like the ideal gas law. And it turns out, maybe counterintuitively, that highly random systems also can be compressed with very simple laws. Yeah. But in the middle, <laughs> between the world of extreme regularities like the celestial mechanics, or on the right, you know, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, you have this domain which has randomness in it, but randomness that accumulates regularities, like evolutionary history, right? That is the domain of complexity. It's the domain of living systems. And people say, well, you mean you're just biologists? <laughs> and we'll say, well, in one sense, yes, but we're studying markets as well. And we're studying ancient civilizations and archeology. span It's the living world that we study, but we study it through that hubristic <laughs> lens of, can we find theories that are general for the living world? And it turns out that theories in that domain have a different character, in part because they have to contend with agency. <clears throat> and, and I would say, if you ask me, what is the, channel of the, 20, the challenge of our century? It is this, it's that two paradigms have emerged to contend with that, machine learning, and complexity science. And I, I'm willing to make that a very broad church, but I am modestified. So. And um, one of them is highly predictive and opaque machine learning. The other one is less predictive, but gives you the possibility of understanding how it actually works, explaining to people what's going on, you know, pedagogy. 
Um, and I think that we're at a very interesting bifurcation point in, in our history where that's never happened before. And um, if you look at the 17th and 18th centuries, those two things were very close. Newton could be both predictive, but also teach you how calculus works and you can write down F equals MA. I mean, it's that simple. Nowadays, that's not true. And I think we're now contending with these two churches, <laughs> the predictive, opaque, um, and the explanatory transparent. And I'm very interested in that, in that schism. And you also talk a little bit about that schism with, with the human dream and, and how, that, how, how that relates. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Can you just expand on that? You know, yeah. Well, well, just that that the, then there's human thinking, uh, and and so you have these agents that that don't aren't seeing the transparency of the system, and they're behaving a lot of a lot of what you just talked about in contagion and culture. Yeah, and how do we have that loop back to the agents so that they can change their learning rules or or whatever to change yeah. the system? Yeah, I mean that in a way, but is this is our. This is part of our agenda, right? To understand um, individual freedom in the face of institutional constraint. Right. Um, I don't think we have answers to that. I think we can analyze cases. Um, we still valorize the individual, certainly in, in the United States and the West, there's a very strong emphasis placed on individual creativity, perhaps overstated. You know, we all know that theories aren't really invented by single people. <laughs> through hidden history, there are hidden figures that made huge contributions that get neg neglected or ignored. Um, but I think that is right, carving out the space for individual freedom and free will in the face of these very powerful constraints, which are market driven. I mean, this has been one of my crusades, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with platforms that harness collective power, but when those platforms have an incentive that is misaligned with human freedom, I sort of go to war on them. <laughs> so, and so, and it's, you know, and I, an example of my own field, the, the journal system, scientific publication and peer review, it's a perfect example of a corrupt system because we all know it, everyone's nodding. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Here we are researchers and we are completely beholden to a system that does not have the progression of science at the forefront, but yes. sales. And so it's not that I'm anti-market, it's just when those things become misaligned, then we have to rethink. So we're constantly having these battles. I wish we had them more often <laughs> and we had more victories under our belt. Yeah. So an audience member asks, how can we use these uh, complexity models to appreciate better the external drivers for the changes we see? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, that gets back to, to your question, Derek, earlier, which is they, in some sense, formalize the contributions of the constraints. I mean, that's partly what they're all doing. I mean, they're trying to, you know, where do we have free, freedom to move and, and where are the constraints established by the institutional feedback? And, and I think in every case, we sort of have to sort of analyze how much is being driven by the constraint and, and how much is being driven by our decisions which may, is made even more complicated by the fact that our decisions emerge through a history of institutional feedbacks. So it's not even clear that we are free. I mean, there are some very difficult issues hiding in these circular feedback systems where you, how to attribute causality, but, but they do. I mean, just to get the question, you can actually do that. You can partition for any given synchronous observation, how much comes from the constraint and how much is coming from your internal state. Right. So you can start getting at those things. I uh, want to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about learning rules the, the, based on the success of the uh, corresponding in institution there. Um, say a, a little bit more about, are the learning rules merely evolutions of, of the original rules, meaning like their schema that are just evolving as a result of feedback? Yeah. So what... Um... The paper actually that goes into detail on this is actually going to be published on May 16th, and it's called um, Institutional Dynamics and Learning Rules. So that will go, that might help people. Um, 
that was for that particular model a full discrete enumeration of all possible learning models. So we can do that in this very simple setting. Um, and then pick any given one, right, and ask what are the implications if that were being used. Um, so we don't have, we don't look at the full continuous space between all rules and so on. Um, but I think the purpose of, of that work was to show that there is a, I think, quite counterintuitive relationship between the local incentive reward system and the ensuing institutional dynamic. That, that's the purpose of that work, because if you look at the literature on institutions, it, it, it tends to work at the institutional level. It doesn't have these multiple time scales, which is mathematically, by the way, hard. And this is something that's a hidden idea here that one should surface, which is that much of theorizing for good reasons is led by analytical expediency. Right. right? I mean, especially economics, um, where they love that. And the question for our community is, when are we willing to forfeit that? And that's really the move to machine learning or simulation, right? Where you say, you know what? <laughs> no, I mean, it's so far from reality. I don't care if you understand your model, it's useless, you know? And, and that's a kind of, uh, people set that threshold at different points somehow. It, it would be very interesting, you might know, why do we do that psychologically? Why do we have different preferences for that? Uh, I think we have time for one. Do we have time for one more? Laura? Let's, yes, let's we have time it. for one or two more. Okay, good. Uh, so another audience question, uh, it's actually two questions. Does your work provide any insight into the role of relationships of the agents of systems? And second, does the fact that contagion hovers around criticality have anything to do with enhancement of adaptive capacity of the agents. Oh, that's, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think the, the latter, that's very interesting. Um, I think the answer has to be yes to that second part, because as in the example, right, of, of hovering by R0 equals one, it's precisely because we are so adaptive that that happens, right? Because as soon as we observe the information bearing on the subcritical regime, we take our masks off. If we weren't adaptive, we wouldn't. We would fix, and the, actually the pandemic would go away. It's sort of a peculiar, perverse situation to be in. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. Um, adaptability is, I think, the key ingredient of tuning to criticality. And um, but you know, what are we gonna to do to get rid of adaptability? Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's a it's, it's, it's hard thing. And the first part seemed to me more obscure. I wasn't sure I understood the first part of the question. Well, I, I think that's interesting. And okay. I wanna follow up on that. So a lot of the systems that our students deal with are, is, is you know, so you found this, this uh, result from a mathematical model, but how do you feedback that, that learning to the agent? Like in the case of COVID, if the, if the individual agents could change their schema or their mental model, so therefore changing their you know, behavior, you would get, a, we, we could get rid of COVID, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. how do we take, you know, it seems to me the hard part is we learn these things about the, at the systemic level, but how do you get the individual agents to change based on that awareness. I mean, that seems to be like the crux of the whole thing. It is, and, and actually there, it's even worse for climate change because it's interesting. I was in um, sabbatical at Harvard actually when the pandemic hit. And I was actually working at the Center for the Environment, which works on climate. And immediately the conversation we were having is, oh dear, um, <laughs> how do we deal with systems that are massive global collective commons problems, yes. like, like ameliorating climate change, um, but also operate on timescales where the, where the change of our behavior is not, the implications of changing our behavior are not obvious. Yeah. So you just gave a good example. I think that um, in COVID, at least we see it, right? Now, yeah. part of seeing it is we adapt in the wrong direction to yes. the earlier question. Um, 
So climate's a problem because there's no feedback. <laughs> it's like there's no, the learning rule can't, no learning rule. No learning rule happens and there's so, so like, much delay. There's so much delay. Yeah. And what I've heard discussed here is how do, what are the appropriate metaphors that we could start inculcating in people's yeah. minds that would help them understand delayed feedback. For example, yes. gardening, gardening. Anyone who plants a garden, right? And I'm very impatient, I'm not, I'm not good at that stuff. <laughs> but there are people who are very good at it. And they, you realize I'm gonna do all this now, but I'm not gonna see the fruits of my labor for probably about three seasons. Right. Because it's gonna be really scrabby next year and, then, you know, and so on. And I think there are things that humans do that have those longer time scales where we're willing to operate with delayed gratification, right? delayed right. reward um it doesn't seem to be the case here and i think i don't have an answer but i suspect educating people to think about pandemics and things like them the way they would think about gardening or something yeah. um, uh, would be very powerful and but unfortunately we do the opposite because we say we're going to have an rna vaccine in a month right right and so whatever virtuous long-term thinking we started to mature is immediately obliterated well, by the expediency yeah. of an instantaneous vaccine right yeah, yeah. Now, i'm not blaming vaccine development that's fantastic but these things are actually kind of in competition yeah. in our minds yeah I, I love the idea of the metaphors and, and kind of metaphors we live by like the fruits of our labor really is built into that is a metaphor of delay Yes. And, and so if we had these sort of systems metaphors that we could, you know, raise children on, yes. then when they get to adulthood, they would they would sort of understand that uh, cause and effect aren't always uh, neighbors on you, a timeline. And Derek, you just recursively use the metaphor by saying raising children. It's, it's another yes. example. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, I really appreciate the talk. It's an amazing talk and uh, amazing ideas. And uh, I wish we had many more hours to, to chat, but thank you for, for uh, your, your talk and, and answering questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Derek and Laura, for inviting me and hope to see you some point at SFI virtually one person, but um, yes. much appreciated. Okay, see take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.